up in my headphones, Charles? Turning it up? Hello, 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 everybody, one and all. Welcome to yet another very exciting episode of the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. My name is Charles, and with me today, as always, is my lifelong friend and co-host, Dylan. I'm ready to talk some fantasy with my friend, Charles. I am ready to talk some fantasy with my friend as well, Dylan, but not just any fantasy today. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I was thinking about this. It's like, I used to do it to kind of interrupt you, like say, oh, and now you like tee me up for it. And I'm like, it sounds forced. (laughs) We'll have to iron it out. (laughs) Yeah. I'm like, I'm like. Uh oh, <laughs> the cue has always been uh, we we've never actually talked it out. No, this is the first time we're addressing it. But uh, yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll work it out. <laughs> yeah, I think I like if you just talk through, and I'm just like, oh, and you're just got it. Roll. All right, so we can so try that let's again. Keep rolling. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 we're keeping it. Okay. So, what are we here to talk about today, Charles? Not just any old fantasy, Dylan, because we are talking about fantasy books that changed our lives oh yes this is a big high level conversation here these aren't just any fantasy books these are the ones that we have read that have impacted us in such a way that we would go as far as to say they have changed our lives yeah and it was interesting to me when i first started thinking about this a bunch of books started coming up pretty quickly. I don't know if you had the same experience, Charles. Yeah, well, for me, it was interesting because I had like the stuff that obviously I read when I was younger and more impressionable. And then some like, I was kind of thinking for the first time about some recent stuff. And I was like, you know what? Some of these more recent reads have changed our lives. And that was a little, a fun little exercise for me to do this. I considered series that I hadn't thought of before because I mean I got the classics but then there's you know recent history too well said Charles so shall we just get into it I yeah, mean man. the the premise is pretty simple it's talking through these books that have impacted us enough that come from the fantasy or speculative fiction genre that we'd say actually significantly changed our lives in one way or another we'll talk through what our history is with these series as well as like how we think that they changed our lives very well said dylan and i think the first series that we have to address right away because it applies to both of us and with like this is the series that changed our lives in such a way that the show was able to exist And that is A Song of Ice and Fire uh, by George R.R. Martin. Yeah, so folks who've been listening for a while will probably know that while Charles had some history with the fantasy genre, that he'll get into more going back to Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, stuff like that. Spoilers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this is a spoiler free episode, but you cannot be safe from spoilers of things that come later in the episode. Spoiler alert, it, Lord of the we, Rings was influential for us yes, <laughs> as a fantasy <yeah>. podcast. <laughs> yes, yeah, so sorry to ruin that, but we'll get there. I I'll say that I, on the other hand, was not a huge fantasy fan before watching Game of Thrones, which maybe will surprise some people folks because now we're podcasting about fantasy and we're both huge enthusiasts of the genre but i really feel i owe all of that to like game of thrones the show and then subsequently a song of ice and fire the books and this is such a revolutionary uh, i guess multimedia story that was being told that i was enraptured by the show so much that i was like oh, maybe I like fantasy. Maybe I could try the books and see where things go from there. Right. And I think it did that for a lot of people, you know, like the popular consensus around fantasy, like, oh, yeah, Lord of the Rings, you have elves and dwarves and wizards, you know, be kind of writing it off. But I think Game of Thrones brought the conversation to a lot more people. It's like, hey, look, there's actually like – 
more mature, turned down kind of themes here and it's more down to earth and it can be super violent and and like yeah. you know all these and like it can be super more about scheming and you can have like these personalities and these characters and this drama that you wouldn't have thought possible when you think of it as like oh potions and spells it's like well there's that which is always awesome but then you have this this like drama and these political schemes and all these things that just enraptured like the whole world for many years Right. I mean, I'm embarrassed to say it now as someone who's <laughs> super into fantasy, but I think I had some almost like biases and uh, stereotypes of what fantasy novels and fantasy content are supposed to be and my they have not held up at all now that I've actually gotten into uh, fantasy since watching Game of Thrones and the path that's uh, set me on, but way back, <laughs> you know, we're talking Geez, how long ago was that at this point, Charles? Maybe the first game almost of a Thrones? decade or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's been a but, long time. Yeah, I mean, way back to that point, I think me, alongside a lot of other people, just didn't really know a lot about fantasy beyond things like the Lord of the Rings, and we assumed everything was just a carbon copy of Lord of the Rings. And A Song of Ice and Fire, for me, opened my eyes to the fact that that wasn't the case, uh, and then led me down a path where I got to read all sorts of other stuff that wasn't just a carbon copy of Lord of the Rings. Right. That being said, uh, Charles, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, we'd be remiss not to talk about uh, the Lord of the Rings, right? Yeah. When it comes to fantasy books that changed our lives. Yeah, I mean, Game of Thrones, like that first book is so amazing and the stuff that happens in it, the characters, the dialogue, so right. original and just blew my mind and i would say though that perhaps the most influential for me i I think ice and fire takes a really solid second place but lord of the rings has to take Mm -hmm. the number one spot just because it caught me at such a impressionable age you know and 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 the movies those lord of the rings movies like totally just captured my imagination and i remember waiting for them to come out in the theaters and and being just blown away like from the music to the acting to all the characters and just the epic nature of the battles and it 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 captured my imagination in a way that like no other fantasy series really has because i mean george just shocks me and wows me constantly Mm -hmm. but like lord of the rings just whisks me away you know and i'll always just remember I mean, th- that's one of the series that I've read over and over again. It's the movies I've watched the most. And, like, there's so many just magical things going on in, in Lord of the Rings that has mm, in kind of... sense of the word. Yeah, that has um, that has me always going... And now that we read new series, I'm always thinking back on how Lord of the Rings was kind of the genesis for a lot of these. And it, it's just built my appreciation for fantasy up. Um, it's just been a really strong foundation for me. So Lord of the Rings, no surprise, highly influential. And The Hobbit, I read over and over again as as a kid. That was one of the first books that I was like, hey, I kind of want to read this book a second time. You know, that's not something I ever thought. I was like, okay, I read that book, mm-hmm. I'm done, next book. But this one was like, you know, I kind of am, am open to reading this again, <laughs> which was just like not an easy thing to get a younger me to do. Yeah. So uh, you, you, you Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, you, you know, super influential life-changing for sure <laughs> well yeah i wanted to make sure i gave you the chance to talk through all that charles because you have so many aw- awesome things to say about how lord of the rings has changed your life and influenced you <laughs> and i'd say the lord of the rings has changed my life too <laughs> but it's mostly been through you <laughs> right yes. like we're uh, if this is your first episode or whatever we're, li- we're lifelong friends and uh charles though you, you never bang the drum too hard on forcing right me to watch the movies or uh read the books i do remember playing some of the video games with you uh, yeah. though, when we were younger and yeah. i'd say th- the biggest way in which the lord of the rings though has changed my life is that it inspired you to plan out an entire trip to New Zealand. (laughs) And then, and uh, you know, we're from New York originally. So we were in New York at this time, all the way on the other side of the world. And then Charles just planning this huge trip to New Zealand and kind of subtly threw me and our friend Derek a uh, 
hey, you know, if you were interested in coming along, then maybe you could. I mean, it's mostly going to be Lord of the Rings sites and stuff, uh, but <laughs> whatever. And that was enough for me where <laughs> I bit, Derek bit, and before we knew it, we were on a trip to New Zealand together, going from the top of the North Island all the way down to the bottom of the South Island, that was climbing so Mount Doom, fun. visiting Hobbiton. So, I mean, that trip was life-changing for me, and it's always such a huge bonding experience between us three friends, you know, we call ourselves the M crew. Uh, <laughs> all right. our last names start with M. But yeah, no, that's when I think of how the Lord of the Rings changed my life, that's where I go first. That's a great point to bring up. The the fact that that trip came together at the time it did and, you know, just how, how much fun we had on that trip, you know, it's it it was a life changing trip for sure. You know, we, we, we never really traveled too much together, but it was like, Hey, you know, we've, we've been friends since grade school. And like, it was right on the cusp of us kind of moving like into other States and things like that. So it was just a really great trip. And then just to see another part of the world was just Mm -hmm. all such a fantastic experience. We were lucky we were able to do that. And we got to see so much of lovely New Zealand. And it was all thanks to, me just um all thanks fantasy to planning a yes it was pretty much all th- me fantasy <laughs> planning a trip through all these filming sites in new zealand because i was like bored of my desk job in new york <laughs> charles we should have seen the signs back then that you were going to be a logistical mastermind <laughs> who eventually goes on to be the logistical force behind this entire podcast when you yeah. planned out that entire <laughs> trip. But yeah, you I planned did. I had that a whole thing out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you had this huge binder. I guess just the extent to which you did all of the work and Derek and I did <laughs> we did a little bit you but... guys did some good work and you know what we have early early episodes on the show where we bring Derek on and talk about yes. the trip that although we're very amateur hour even more so <laughs> in our production so. yeah. <laughs> like we're still an amateur show but we were more amateur back then it's still worth a listen because we talk about the trip in detail but yeah there was a lot of moving parts we were in a different city pretty much every day and uh yeah it was just you know yeah. Always life changing when you get to see another almost, another part of the world. Yeah, well, you almost died, Charles. <laughs> yeah. So that would have been quite life changing. When yep, we were climbing Mount Doom. <laughs> you can hear all about our yes. harrowing experiences on Mount Doom in that earlier episode. Um, so yeah, Lord of the Rings, no surprise, makes it on the change your life category in terms of fantasy series. Um, another series that. Um, is more influential to me and is a, a more classic and shouldn't surprise too many people is the Harry Potter series. Now this was another one that came out when we were young and impressionable. And, you know, it's one of the series that, you know, I, I think for a lot of people turned younger kids on to just independent reading. That's like outside of school. And that was certainly the case uh, for me and Harry Potter. And I just have so many fond memories of like being at bookstores like at midnight when the book gets released and seeing these seeing the movies with all my friends when I was like in grade school and I you know attended a, a book signing and got to party. meet JK yeah but birthday yeah, I, I hosted yeah. birthday parties to see <laughs> Harry Potter you know I was Drag really into along. it and yeah Dylan dr- was, was was invited and he came to yes. some of them <laughs> and uh yeah, I got to meet J.K. Rowling. I have a couple first editions signed. So it was just like, you know, it, it, it captures a moment of of childhood that, you know, I'll consider life changing. And definitely, if anything, inspired like a interest in just reading recreationally, just reading fiction and fantasy. And I owe that to Harry Potter. So another really imaginative series. Can't go wrong. Harry Potter. Life changing for sure (laughs) yes i'm glad that you've had that experience charles um yeah harry potter's an interesting one for me um obviously now i'm it's hard not to view it through the lens of the author and all the yeah i mean uh, so i I can't in good faith endorse J.K. Rowling these days. No. Uh, and But all that aside, I'll, I'll also say uh, 
I, I spoke to my mom recently where she was like, you know, this fantasy stuff, like, uh, what wasn't something that you were as into as a kid? And I was, she was like, you know, you really did not like the Harry Potter series. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, I was like the one kid, Charles. Yeah, that did not yeah. Like you have Harry a very Potter. unique perspective, especially now that you're in the fantasy community that you just have no history with Harry Potter beyond yeah. what I was able to drag you into, much like Lord of the Mostly Rings and dragging like, into movie theaters. <laughs> is coming up. Yes, it's just dragging you through all of these older series. But um, yeah, it's you're interesting in that way. But I, I think that's true to just your um, your interests in fantasy. You know, Harry Potter is a a unique one. It's a super popular one, but yeah, it's just. Um, some of these other series that we're talking about here is just not on that same level. Hmm. Well, I have an interesting one that is a little off the beaten path, I think, from the books that get that no- people normally name. I think we've named a lot. I, like basically everything we've named here is stuff that is very likely to come up for any like fantasy yes. podcasters talking yes. about <laughs> books that change their lives. So my next one is the Chathryn Voyage Quartet by Robert V. S. Reddick. And this is a series that I th- I definitely talked about in our underrated book recommendations episode that's still banked that we've <laughs> Not right, Charles. We've right, not we released have not that released episode. It. Yeah, <laughs> right. So I think it's one of the most underrated books I've ever read. Robert V. S. Reddick is a totally awesome guy and an author. Um, from my interaction with Twitter on with him on Twitter, what suggests he's an awesome guy. And I'll say that this series it's basically a series about a almost like fantasy equivalent of the like tight. Ty- it's not like Titanic style in terms of how it's built, but like a giant boat or a giant ship uh, where a bunch of characters, most like young characters head out on this awesome journey. It's pretty high fantasy, I would say like all sorts of different creatures and uh, different, uh, I guess like humanoid races, or I'm not sure if that's what he calls them in the book, but all sorts of high fantasy stuff going on things that were not as present in a song of ice and fire or game of thrones but also had these things that make it a good transition from a song of ice and fire and game of thrones when i was first getting into the fantasy genre and trying something different from the song of ice and fire books i think this was the second series that i read after a song of ice and fire right if i'm correct i kind of remember it that way yeah that way so the things that I think are make it made it a good fit and made it something that that bestfancybooks.com website that we used all the time when we <laughs> yeah. were first getting into the genre. A right. uh, uh, big thing that they said was that there's like politicking going on mm. and good characters and uh, lots of sort of these delicate navigations of social situations. I saw that going on, especially in the first book, The Red Wolf Conspiracy, but it was... It went that next step into kind of unabashed high fantasy in a way that I think I I had to see done well for me at this critical juncture in my right. life, seeing if I'm like a fantasy reader or I'm just a fan of A Song of Ice and Fire. Right. I needed this to go well to become a fantasy reader. And it really did. Like, love the way the characters grow throughout the series. It's kind of got that stuff. I know we were just recently talking with uh, Stephen and Jake from Phantology about how their experiences of the Wheel of Time characters – a big part of it is how much they get to grow throughout the long 14 book series. And they start pretty young. Uh, the Chaffin Voyage Quartet by nature being quartet is four books, but it has that kind of feeling. That's one of the big things that I grasp onto with it of the characters where by the end of it, I was like, wow, I feel like I've been through so much with these characters. And it's so good for that. It's a great journey. There's more just kind of like soft magic stuff going on. And I think, when I got through all of it, and it's also got and what I think is an incredible ending and is a divisive ending, I'll just say. <laughs> and it's just this series for me that sticks out as like 
if this was bad, <laughs> I do not think I would keep reading fantasy. I'd say, oh, I guess I liked A Song of Ice and Fire, but that's probably like the best one, so I don't like fantasy. Right. But instead, it was really good, and I was like, maybe I really like fantasy. Yeah, and I, I was just thinking kept going that there's there. this um, alternate universe out there in which you didn't like Chathryn Voyage and therefore like was dismissive of all fantasy, and this podcast doesn't exist. Oh, you know? yeah. <laughs> hundred percent i think there's no i mean maybe there's other books that i could have picked up that would have had a similar you know i've loved so many fantasy novels at this point i'm sure there are a bunch i could have picked up and had something of that experience where i was like oh i guess i like fantasy but we're lucky in terms of being people who like got really into fantasy and started a podcast and that's how it's changed our lives is like that i picked up chather and voyage and it, it influenced me in this way because, yeah, I don't think we're sitting here right now if, uh, it, I guess, if Chathryn Voyage didn't live up to what I was hoping for, which it did. Luckily. Yeah, you've been talking about this one for a long time, and it's such a unique uh, series to you, I feel like. like. I've had a lot of conversations with fantasy enthusiasts, and, you know, everyone talks about all the big ones, Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings, Wheel of Time, what have you, but, like... To me, like Chathryn Voyage is very much like a a Dylan series, if that makes any (laughs) sense. And it's been at the top of my TBR just because of how much it has, you know, captured your attention. And, you know, I think very highly of your opinions. We see eye to eye on a lot of stuff uh, in the world of literature. So um, it's one of those things that I hope we can read soon (laughs) because um, it's definitely piqued my interest and i recognize it as a show that has kind of stuck out in your uh, in your reading library as a book or i guess a series a book series yeah Yeah, series uh yeah it's yeah i mean i'm super interested because i read it so long ago at this point charles like this (laughs) was i think my second series after song rise and fire so i i'm curious to look at it with fresh eyes as someone who's read all these different fantasy novels at this point and can try to pinpoint because there are definitely things where i'm like looking back i'm like oh those are basically the elves equivalent but i mean as weird as it was i wasn't even a big lord of the rings fan yet (laughs) so i was like whoa these (laughs) these creatures that live forever (laughs) not forever but live really long and have this sort of sanctuary i was like that's amazing (laughs) um I think now those kind of things wouldn't have the same level of charm, but there's all sorts of stuff I do think back to that are not like anything that I've read since. And this setting of being on the ship and these characters going through all this growth, I do expect, and the ending, like that ending. Yeah, but you've praised it before, and I'm so excited to read it. Like I'm so interested. Yeah. (laughs) Trying to imagine what it could possibly be, you know, after hearing you talk about it, it's like, I need to know what, what happens yeah. in this series. <laughs> it's, yeah, I think you'll, when you get to the ending, this is as good as I can do without spoiling it. When you get to the ending, I think you will see why it helped make me a big fantasy fan in the okay. way that I am now. Okay. I, I can't say any more than that because I don't want to spoil it for you or our listeners. <laughs> I but appreciate I think you will that. know it. Charles, you'll get it with just knowing me as long as you have. I'm excited. You'll have to pitch it someday in Friends Pitching Fantasy so we can read it. (laughs) That will be a big day for all of us, Charles. Indeed. I know there's another series that you wanted to bring up today that, you know, is a very unique Dylan experience as well. Do you just want to jump into that one? Sure. Yeah. So I'm going to cheat here by saying that one of the fantasy books that changed my life is the video game Final Fantasy <laughs> Nine. <laughs> so, that counts. It counts. I, I mean, it totally doesn't. It totally is not a book. <laughs> no, but, you know, this is our podcast, so we can talk about whatever we want. Fair. And I think that Final Fantasy Nine for me, is another one of those just... I actually think I, I played it maybe my first year of college or I, I I actually got introduced to it by a friend of mine who was basically playing it and I was like watching every time he played and kind of like at times I would play some so we kind of played it together and then you actually you know Brent but yeah it, yeah so oh 
my friend, my friend Brent was doing most of the playing, but I was like, dude, do not play unless I'm there to watch. Because for <laughs> me, the Final Fantasy games are always more about the story than they are about <laughs> the gameplay anyway. And I got really into it. And it was more the fact that someone just happened to be playing a fantasy game on my TV, because I don't think he had one in his room, than anything else. And I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. This like medieval setting and <laughs> magic and stuff. <laughs> right. And I think I was just starting to... It was piquing my interest, and I was noting the signs that maybe I was someone who likes fantasy. So this actually came before I think I watched Game of Thrones at all, but mm. it primed me in a way where I was like, when this Game of Thrones show came out and it's medieval and stuff, I'm like, you know, I did like Final Fantasy Nine. And that's a very medieval, it's kind of like cartoony style in terms of the animation and stuff, but it's very medieval, more medieval than... Um, most Final Fantasy games, which tend to be st sort of steampunk. And I played a lot of Final Fantasy since then, as as you know, Charles, and probably any <laughs> listeners who follow me on Twitter. And I love Final Fantasy still. I play Final Fantasy uh, whenever I get the chance. And this, this set me up on a path, Charles, for being primed and ready for the way that A Song of Ice and Fire really got me into the fantasy genre. Yeah, I feel like getting you to become a fantasy fan took a long time of these little <laughs> suggestions and like, oh, yeah. here's a video game. And you're like, hey, that's cool. And, but it's like, oh, but like, someone else is playing it. Magic like, and medieval. Me. Yeah. And it's like, oh, this TV show coming out. Oh, hey, the, you know, it's like <laughs> it, it took a long time to get you from Final Fantasy IX to reading Lord of the Rings on the show, you know, so. <laughs> I I, th I think it's how, how funny it's been that all these suggested things of like you slowly, almost subliminally falling for the right. fantasy genre. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, Charles, you can probably speak to this better than I can, but as my lifelong friend, you know, sometimes it can be difficult to convince me of things you might say, um, but usually once I'm convinced, then I <laughs> am. Yeah relentless <laughs> yeah, it, it's much easier to have uh, dylan suggest things than to try and talk him into it <laughs> so it's like hey you know you like game of thrones you like final fantasy why don't you try reading some of these books and you're like okay chapter and voyage like game of thrones okay i really like that okay all these other series and now it's like all right i'll read lord of the rings <laughs> so like, yeah. we did it guys we did it <laughs> and now reading wheel of time thanks to you i and know Steven i can't and believe Jake it <laughs> and everyone else uh, who's talked me into that so here we are charles i mean <laughs> you picked it too you picked lord of the I rings know. you picked wheel of time <laughs> yeah so very exciting stuff so yep yeah, big Big influential moments there. Um, I guess the 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 fantasy book that is kind of unique to my journey and kind of off the beaten path. Uh, still a very popular book, but it's more science fiction, so it is also kind of cheating. But it's it's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick. And for anyone that's not familiar with that book, it's the um, inspiration for. Blade Runner. So Blade Runner is basically a movie adaptation of mm -hmm. Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which first of all, the title right away just captured my imagination in that oh, sense. Yeah. It's such an epic title. Incredible. Like I wish more books were like <laughs> named like this. You know, yeah. I, I get why it's not. It is a lot to type out and to remember, but it, it it's such a poignant like Think of thinker of a title that you're like, man, this is just poetry almost. Do androids dream of electric sheep? And it's a science fiction book in which there's androids trying to live amongst humanity, and there's people trying to hunt out these androids and and separate them from society. And there's things like, oh, animals are like a status symbol, and some people try and posture by having android animals you know and it would be kind of scandalous if it was ever found out that it wasn't a real animal it was an android and and technology's progressed in such a way that it's super hard almost impossible to tell them apart and the story is told in such an imaginative way it got me thinking of like what speculative fiction can do in terms of 
like talking about the human condition, which is something we talked a lot about and why do we like fantasy? Yeah. And I think a lot of the reason a lot of my answers for why I like fantasy were questions that I first thought of reading Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, where it's like, oh, what is it to be human when you have a world where androids are almost indistinguishable from humans and how would humanity kind of react to that like how they don't you know they just accept and love somebody then you find out they're an android and all of a sudden that changes your opinion of them you know so it's like those kinds of things and identity and stuff like that it just really like i was like oh this is what fiction can do because you know there's like harry potter and lord of the rings which is a fun epic creative journey but then there's these things like do androids team of electric sheep that get you actually to think about like wow there's like how humans exist in this world you know and what they would do in these fantastic situations in which things like super realistic androids exist so i had to throw that out there and I, the book cover was always the book title was always inspirational to me as well so just those things are what really has it stick out for me like it's to it's kind of dated in a way it's like really like you know classic science fiction um but like the themes it addresses you know philip k dick was very creative in his in his storytelling there's a lot of really cool stuff that he's thought up and it might be kind of bizarre to read some of it today but for the most part it's just really really um creative writing that always stuck out to me as kind of life-changing and how I analyzed fiction, if that makes sense. Yeah. So you're basically saying it sounds like that this book got you really excited about the possibilities provided by the speculative fiction genre or like that umbrella term of uh, SFF, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. Sci-fi fantasy. And I've always thought that, you know, it, it reminds me a lot, Charles. I, well, am I allowed to say what you did or didn't pick in Friends Pitching Fantasy? Sure. Yet? Yeah, I think okay. so. <laughs> it reminds me, although you did not pick uh, Ken Liu's uh, The Paper Menagerie and Other Stories, right. uh, that there's a quote that I grabbed from his preface where he basically he says like he doesn't differentiate between sci-fi and fantasy really and he <laughs> says all fiction is about prizing the logic of metaphors some stories simply literalize their metaphors a bit more explicitly mm -hmm. and i felt that that's kind of why the sci-fi and fantasy genres fit so well together under that speculative fiction brand it's like okay well yeah, maybe you're doing it with sci-fi and then you're probably doing it with technology or maybe you're doing it with fantasy and then you're probably doing it with magic. But really, end game here, it's about how are you literalizing your metaphors when you're telling a story. And it sounds like that's something that Philip K. Did. I mean, uh, I wouldn't be the first one to say that's something <laughs> that Philip K. Dick does extremely well and something that you really latched on to yeah that's a really the, great perspective and a great quote also i, I remember you had oh, I brought that it. up on another episode it's so true um you know they teach you an english class if you remember dylan back uh, <laughs> mr miller yes. shout out to mr miller our <laughs> exactly. english teacher sitting in english class analyzing metaphors for me this was like the first time that it was like engaging and provocative and you need sometimes you have to discover it for yourself and that was the case here i was a lot younger too so that had a huge part of it as well so like the way i analyze and appreciate certain stories in fantasy is a lot to do with like something that switched on in my brain from reading to android's dream of electric sheep so that's just why i had to put it on the list <laughs> well said, Charles. Well, you want to know something that switched on in my brain after <laughs> reading a fantasy novel? Yes. <laughs> or a series, I guess, is after reading the first Law series by Joe Abercrombie, yes. which is another, I think I was already bought in on fantasy by the time I was reading the first Law series. So it's not, it doesn't have the role that I've been describing for a lot of these, which are kind of like, how did I end up a person who spends as much time reading fantasy and talking about fantasy and engaging with people on social media about fantasy, which is like <laughs> how so many of these things changed my life. But I think I was already bought in by the time I got to the first Law series. It definitely helped and 
like maybe my favorite series of anything I've read. But the biggest way it's changed my life, Charles, I've, I, I think I've mentioned this before on the podcast, is just more than anything, the phrase, once you've got a task to do, it's better to do it than live with the fear of it. Yeah. And I think about that maybe on a daily basis, Charles. <laughs> like, I mean, I'm... Folks who've been listening probably know I'm pursuing my PhD in counseling psychology right now, and uh, I'll say that often comes with a lot of tasks to do that one <laughs> could easily live in the fear of doing. Uh, and I think that just the way that that's become a mantra for me, it's something that Logan Ninefingers, if you haven't read the first Law series, it's something that Logan Ninefingers says all the time when he's got something just unpleasant he wants to take care of. Uh, and... I just started saying that to myself because I used to procrastinate so much, Charles, so much. Right. And uh, you remember me in high school. Yeah. <laughs> I was probably I was oh, cranking yeah. it out right before <laughs> like lunch, the period before <laughs> Mr. Miller's class. I was doing my like, let me figure out what this metaphor means because <laughs> this is coming up in two periods. Yeah. And then, I mean, to be able to actually have a shot of getting all the work that us adults have to be able to get done. I've had to learn from Logan how to stop living with the fear of it and just to get a task done once I've got a task to do. And I legitimately would say maybe not. I don't know. It might be every day. Wow. It might be every day. Yeah. I, I mean, Logan Nine Fingers got into a lot of people's minds and he's such a great character. <laughs> I think for me, what the first Law series, how it's influenced me the most, like my journey of reading it, it was kind of like my Chathryn voyage where it's like I read Game of Thrones devoured it and I was looking to get more into this modern fantasy and it was one of those early ones and mm. as a series it stood out to me so much that I remember being like wow fantasy has a lot more to offer than I ever thought and that was never more apparent than reading First Law like Abercrombie just has such a unique voice and what he sought out to do in First Law was like was so different than the other fantasy yeah. series that I had been reading that it just made me so much more curious about more modern authors and how they're kind of carving their place in the genre because of how successful Abercrombie was. So like just the humor aspects of it, the S word subverting aspects of it, and also the like the humor <laughs> and the and the characterization and all these fantastic things that were happening. It's like not we're we're so far beyond Tolkien clones now. We're where we have these authors telling their own unique stories and, and Abercrombie kinda kicked off a lot of that for me and I was like, Fantasy has a lot more to offer. I gotta start reading new authors now and then see what, what's going on in the modern fantasy world. Yeah, that's so well said, Charles. I think it's interesting for you as someone who was so influenced by the Lord of the Rings early on. Sure. And then you know, Abercrombie comes in and for folks like you who cut their teeth on Tolkien's work it's like this this guy is coming in and <laughs> pretty intentionally subverting and changing a lot of the stuff that we're used to in the fantasy genre because I think Abercrombie is such a unique and interesting voice and just like person from what I've gathered from watching interviews and stuff like that, just his way of thinking about things. He's very like psychological, got a little bit of this like cynical side to him. Yeah, a and little bit. A very dry <laughs> sense of humor. <laughs> yes, a little bit. <laughs> I don't want to like, it's a little weirder when you're talking about the person rather than the like work. Like obviously the work is super cynical in a lot of ways, but I don't want to say like, I don't know John oh, yeah. Crumpy. I want to say he's like a cynical guy, but I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. I'll just say that. And he's got this very dry sense of humor, both in his work and just when he's talking and being interviewed and stuff. And he, you know, you just, it's basically this lens, like we're putting on the Joe Abercrombie lenses and taking a look at Lord of the Rings is what, Abercrombie invites you to do in a lot of ways with the first law. Mm -hmm. And for someone like you, it must have been like, what is going on with these lenses? Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's like, this is a fantasy book unlike any I've ever read. Because even Game of Thrones, which was progressive in so many ways, like it was still so firmly rooted in like 
all these swords and sorcery aspects but first law was so rooted in these characterizations and these characters mm. were like kind of funny and you're like so whoa true. like this is a like totally different way to interpret a fantasy series while still being fantasy and like that is what always sticks out to me in terms of like my experience with first law and mm. like rereading it has been such a great experience as well and like yeah. i'm excited to continue reading about it and talking about those characters it's so so good <laughs> right definitely that's a big part of what i love so much about is that you can tell abercrombie cares so much about well the psychology of his characters right. and he he takes his time and focus toward that in a way that I mean, you see happen a lot more now in fantasy, yes. but coming from someone like your perspective when you were reading it, where it's like you're used to Tolkien, which is a little bit more removed from the like <laughs> direct yeah. point of view of the characters yeah. yes. and yes. way more focused on this like, let me tell this big epic tale <laughs> with these big heroes. And Abercrombie's is like, let me put you right in the middle of yeah. <laughs> Logan Nine Fingers POV yeah. here, and you're gonna deal with all his pondering yeah. and barbarian <laughs> philosophy ways yes. in a, such a psychological manner, and it's so yes. great. It's super yeah, well it's said. Fantastic. A great modern voice, and for me, another series with a really strong modern voice, and the reason why it's on this changed our lives list is Saga. And Saga is a graphic novel series, which is also unique to this list, written by Brian K. Vaughn and illustrated by Fiona Staples. And mm. I put this on the list because it's another example of what a modern fantasy story can be. Um, you know, First Law kind of was like, here's a different way to tell a fantasy story, but Saga is, is another one that is incredible in its characterization and the story it decides to tell the characters they're not like like a gandalf who's like the most powerful character in the world they're just two super ordinary people trying to exist in this grand epic fantasy world and it pulls them in so many different ways and that's what's captivating about saga it's like such a fresh story such a modern story you have such a, a a diverse cast of characters and they're all super like fleshed out with these modern voices you know there's lots of like cursing and lots of like you know crude things going on but it's it's so so fresh and exciting to me i was like this is one of the best not just graphic novel stories but just stories in general and that's another thing too like I had a conception of graphic novels going into reading Saga that was just totally wiped away. I was like, oh, so you can you can tell a lot more of a story than I thought. You know, it's not just like blood and guts or superheroes. It, it's like you can tell a really emotional, like human story. And, you know, Saga is a huge part of that for me. So had to make it on this changed our lives list. Gotcha. Yeah, because this was the one. So I love Saga. It's one of my favorite stories, Hard yes. Stop. And I, you know, Brian K. Vaughn's storytelling and Fiona Staples illustration, unbelievable. So, <laughs> like, it's what I do, all so right. Good. And I mean, I get, I think it was the one that I saw in here, and I wasn't entirely sure what you were going to say in terms of how it changed your life, I guess. Because I was like, I would. If you literally just had me name, like, what are your favorite stories ever, you know, like I said, Saga would come up for me, but I didn't think of it as changing my life. Right. But I guess it, for me, it's made me someone who, I guess, similar to you, Charles, but I haven't read as many graphic novels as you have or comics. It's made me someone who's like, oh, you can tell amazing stories in this medium. And, you know, now we've read things like, monstrous and you know thanks to the great beth tabler at <laughs> beth tabler give her a follow yes <laughs> uh, and uh yeah you know i've gotten to see the like amazing things that are being offered in that medium and i think that that i might not have gotten there without mm, saga um 
and the wonderful folks who recommend <laughs> things like monstrous sure. to me. So yeah, and I can't stress enough how progressive this story feels to me. Like we're so, in yeah. like this new era of modern fantasy, and I think Saga just fits into that mold so well. You know, you read all these classics like The Lord of the Rings and even like The Wheel of Time and stuff like that. And then you read Saga and it's like, we have come a long way. And, you know, <laughs> and I, I, for me, I, it's just like, I got to rethink like how to tell an original story, you know, like this, like mm. Saga achieves that so masterfully. So big fan. Mm. Yeah, sounds like it instilled a whole nother level of passion for just the craft of storytelling. Very well said. Than you had before. Absolutely, absolutely. Like you said, mm. best one of my favorite stories. Hard stop. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's nothing like Saga, and I mean, uh, another book, Charles. That I would say there's nothing like in many ways is uh, the Mistborn trilogy yeah. by Brandon Sanderson. And I think probably the way in which for, for me, there's nothing like Mistborn is there's nothing like Mistborn for turning on a new fan to the fantasy genre. So I think we've talked a lot here, Charles, about how uh, like both of us have gotten to the place where we're huge fantasy enthusiasts, and we talk about on our podcast right, for hours right. every week and we can't, like can't get enough and when you reach that place charles a next step becomes how do we give back <laughs> how do we go beyond and get people to follow this same path that we've followed what will be their chatherin voyage right, charles right. and uh, for me, while I would always recommend the Chatham Voyage too, one of the first things that I'll recommend to folks I'm trying to bring into the fantasy genre is the Mistborn trilogy by Brand Sanderson. I mean, we're talking about from Sanderson's work. He's he's a number one New York Times bestselling author, and the things that he's getting that for are a thousand plus pages. Right. Uh, so he has this ability to write epic fantasy in a way that is so accessible. I mean, that's the thing. Sarison's so impressive in so many ways, and maybe the thing that I find most impressive is that. And if, if it's a way that Mistborn has changed my life, it's by being a book that I've actually been able to get, like, I think four or five people in my, uh, my PhD program to be able to, like, actually pick up and read, and, like, all of them have really enjoyed it. And then all of a sudden, look what you're doing. Yeah. You're <laughs> a person who has potentially made another fan of the fantasy genre and you're talking to other people out there. You know, we love talking on the podcast. We love talking on Twitter. And we also love talking to folks that we uh, meet in our day-to-day -day lives and turning folks into fantasy fans is uh, a way I think Mistborn has helped change my life. That's very well said. I'm with you a hundred percent there. I'd say just to add on to Mistborn, there's this like meta aspect in which we talk about fantasy that I think I was first kind of turned on to through Mistborn because Sanderson is just so public about his writing process and his the way he plots a story and the way he weaves in threads and you know just reading about like the structure of a fantasy story and then talking about fantasy in the way we do a lot now on the show is like yeah how does the author setting this up how is he delivering on the reading experience how is he you know like threading these stories in and and for me Mistborn was kind of the gateway in terms of having those kinds of conversations a lot of that goes towards obviously Sanderson being so generous with his Right. With his time and his knowledge. Time and insights. Yeah, and his insight. Yeah, and, exactly. and, and then, like, being able to then use those resources that he provides uh, to have conversations between us and, and on the show. So, life changing in that it's like, here is fantasy, like, as a like, fantasy writing, as a philosophy, as a style, mm -hmm. and being able Almost to sign. And being like, okay, here's how Sanderson's science of fantasy works. How does that differ from Abercrombie's or from mm. George Martin's? And it's those conversations that have like fueled content on this show so much. Like how often do we compare things to what like Sanderson has done or to what Tolkien has done, you know? And I think just Sanderson being able to kind of lift the veil a little bit and talk to his audience in a way that we can 
see what his real intentions are has helped so much with that. So totally agree, Charles. And you're talking about stuff that has fueled content on this show. <laughs> I think that that <laughs> it's hard to do better than Red Sister by friend of the show, Mark Lawrence, for things that have fueled content for us. And just like instilled a whole nother level of self-efficacy for yes. us as podcasters yeah. and like taking ourselves a little bit more seriously as people who like maybe can talk about this stuff and other people would want to listen because uh, when we were doing our buddy read of Red Sister by Mark Lawrence, we just kind of threw it out there. We tagged uh, the great Mark Lawrence sure. in there. Just kind of like, I don't know. I don't know if I even thought, twice about why I was doing that. Um, but, you know, it was so long ago, I didn't make those kind of decisions. We were like, not think of ourselves as like people out in the community. We were just like this lonely Twitter account. Yeah. And uh, we throw out like this t tweet of, hey, like we did a buddy read of Red Sister by Mark Lawrence. And then I just, I'll never forget oh, that day, gosh, Charles, because uh, at some point, we just saw that, like, Mark Lawrence had uh, liked it, and then he retweeted it and actually commented saying it was a great listen, yes. Charles. And I, will, uh, I was thinking, that, like, that's the thing that goes on the, if, if there was a Friends Talking Fantasy book with a cover, <laughs> it would say, a great listen, <laughs> Mark Lawrence, Absolutely. international best-selling author. Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, I feel a little like, uh, you know, it's braggy talking about it or whatever, but I'll say that this changed everything for us as people who podcast about fantasy to have someone like Mark Lawrence that we have admired for so long, so much longer before Years. we ever even thought to make a podcast talking about it. And then we just talk about his work and he actually appreciated it we're like oh like maybe this is something other people would appreciate if mark lawrence appreciates it then hopefully other people will too and i think in terms of us being like okay well let's like let's do this let's go all in let's be podcasters yeah. about fantasy right. that was a huge moment that changed our lives in that way and i remember like uh you and i like like I call you or like talking about like Mark Lawrence. Listen. <laughs> yeah, like I remember when the notifications were, were so coming starstruck. in because it you know it was a, it's like oh Mark Lawrence liked it. I was like whoa that is insane. And it's like oh Mark Lawrence like retweeted. I'm like oh man that's next level. And it's like he commented great listen. I was like dude what is happening right now? I didn't think that was something that was possible for us i'm grinning ear to ear just thinking about it but like yeah, yeah mark lawrence endorsement at that time you know we were so convinced we were just screaming into the void and then to have his kind of like to support have lawrence's yeah. voice answer yeah. <laughs> from the void incredible and then we've been able to you know go through the whole book of the ancestor and we were able to ask mark lawrence questions and oh, even yeah. make an episode of him like answering our questions which was so well, great us us reading his answers. Yeah, yeah. To he our he wrote in some answers to our questions and we read them yes. on the show and that was like so much fun. And then, like when that episode went out into the internet, I was like, that is a, like a milestone for us for, as a show, right. you know, to be able to release an episode like that. And it was just all because of Mark Lawrence's support, of which, you know, if we hadn't read Book of the Ancestor, it wouldn't have happened. So life changing for sure and super appreciative to Mark Lawrence as well for his time and all of that. Yep. It was just such a great moment. And so many of these series are from when I was like 15 <laughs> or younger. So to have one that was in the past three months is, is super special. So uh, yeah, Book of the Ancestor, life-changing for sure. Yep. And also great, great series, great book. Like I think it's for oh, us yeah. sometimes that can get a backseat to the conversation about like how much we've appreciated Mark Lawrence and his support and things like that uh, but also i mean red cyst i pitched it because i've loved that book uh since i read it way before the podcast and things like that red sister is a fantastic book so definitely check that out i'll also say the mark lawrence uh like experience what we're talking about with mark lawrence oh, mark lawrence experience. Uh, um if he ever starts a band then yeah uh, i hope that's what he calls it <laughs> the mark lawrence experience but yeah, this stuff we're talking about with Mark Lawrence, I think 
that's one that's super salient. But the whole, speaking of things that have changed our lives, Charles, I think that uh, probably the, the biggest thing we can talk about in the way maybe like fantasy as a genre has been changing our lives has been the way that we've felt involved in this greater community now. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I have (laughs) all these like friends that I've met through the genre over social media, over, I mean, even just like uh, over collabs and things like that. Like, uh, like now we're (laughs) like, have friends in uh, folks like the folks over at Phantology right. that uh, we actually interact with. And it's what's so amazing, I think, about this genre, maybe more than anything, and something that we were missing before we started doing the podcast was just like there's all these other people out there who are having these same kind of experiences where fantasy means this much to them in the way that all these books have meant so much to us. And we can all like share that together. Right. And that's been life changing as well. Absolutely. This has been this show and the experience of being in the community uh, as part of this show has been a life changing experience for me, for sure. And it's all for the better. You know, I really enjoy doing this and I really enjoy when we get those moments that we can talk to other podcasters or other authors or maybe people that have listened that have written in through email or social media, you know, like being able to have those exchanges is like the best part by a long shot. Like I have people emailing me being like, how could you (laughs) refuse to read um, (laughs) Gentleman Gentleman Bastards? I was like, I'm sorry. (laughs) I'm sorry. It's Dylan's fault. (laughs) So like just to have those moments is, is, is so much fun as well. So the show has been life changing. Oh, Charles. And you know, what has been life changing for me? What? Just being on this lifelong journey of friendship Aww. with you, Charles, and it <laughs> continues in each one I could of not these have said friends it talking better fantasy my episodes. Self, Dylan, <laughs> <laughs> this is a an an important friendship for sure, and I'm happy oh. to be on this this life changing uh, adventure with you as well. Well, you've said it all, Charles. You've said it all. Nothing left but to play that sweet, sweet outro music. Thank you all so much for listening to yet another very exciting episode of the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. This has been your co-hosts, Charles and Dylan. If you like what you heard today and you want to get involved in the conversation, you want to support the show, Twitter is a great way to do that. You can find us at the FTF Podcast with a number one at the end. We are also on Facebook and Instagram at the FTF Podcast. You can always send us an email at the FTF podcast at gmail.com. And Dylan, if they wanted to further support the show in a free, easy way that means a lot to us, and they just so happen to be listening on Apple Podcasts, what can they do? Toss five stars to our yes. podcast. They can click on the Friends Talking Fantasy podcast page on Apple Podcasts app and just scroll all the way down until they start seeing some stars. And if you do see those stars and you want to click five of them, that would be the optimal number that we'd want. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. So then you can also uh, write a review if you do happen to have time. But just getting to this point where you're just hearing listening. me ask you to do this, just listening. That is more than enough. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for listening. We greatly appreciate you. And as always, go forth and conquer, friends.